a critical examination on the bicentenary. This lecture has been organized by Asian Development Research Institute, Adri, in memory of Dr. Piyushendu Gupta and Professor Radha Krishna Chaudhary. Yesterday, we saw eight memorial lectures, a panel of research papers, and also the release of the book, Another Marx, authored by Professor Marcelo Musto. The lectures covered topics such as Karl Marx's prescient theory of centralization of capital, crisis, and an Afrocentric response. Capitalism, neoliberalism, and development in Africa, the response of the African Union. King, Marx, and the revolution of the worldwide value. Developing Marx's critical theory, two lines of thought. How can we use Marxism today? Henrik Hein and Karl Marx as essayists on the genesis of the function of the critic intellectuals. Marxism and the commons, the new challenges for the humanity. We now begin the 22nd lecture in the series of lectures. This lecture is in memory of Georgi Lukács. He was a Hungarian Marxist philosopher, aesthetician, literary historian, and critic. He was one of the founders of Western Marxism, an interpretive tradition that departed from the Marxist ideological orthodoxy of the USSR. He developed the theory of reification and contributed to the Marxist theory with developments of Marxist theory of class consciousness. As a literary critic, Lukács was especially influential because of his theoretical developments of realism and of the novel of a literary genre. This lecture is titled Marx and Engels, the intellectual relationship revisited from an ecological perspective and will be delivered by Professor Kohei Saito. Can I request Professor Kohei Saito to please come on stage? Yes. <laughs> this lecture will be chaired by Professor Marcelo Musto. Marcelo Musto is an associate professor of sociological theory at York University, Toronto. His numerous books and articles have been published worldwide in more than 20 languages. Professor Musto, can I request you to take over the proceedings? Many thanks and good morning everybody. Welcome to the first session <coughs> of um, our fourth day of conference. Um, generally, I've been closing the session in the evenings. Today I have the task to motivate you to start the day. And um, uh, there is also, since I'm from Canada, there is also Canadian weather inside the room, so it's extremely cold and uh, I got some uh, uh, sweater and jacket. <clears throat> um, there is nothing better than um, motivate the session in the beginning of the day by introducing the youngest scholar that is giving uh, a lecture in this conference, Koei Saito. Koei Saito um, got his PhD at Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany, and is already so young, associate professor at uh, Osaka City University in Japan. He has published already several articles, uh, in particular on Marx ecology, on uh, the issue of um, environments. And this is his uh, last uh, and most recent monograph book that is called Karl Marx Ecosocialism, published in uh, English by Monthly Review Press and also in German by Campus Verlag. Koei Saito is also involved in the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe and is one of the editors who are putting together the manuscript of Marx that will be published in the volume 18th of the fourth section. Mm? And um, 
as it has been already said, Coe is going to talk about Marx and Engels, the intellectual relationship, in particular about ecology. So there are a lot of revisitation of the re relationship between Marx and Engels, and it will be very interesting for us to see from the ecological points of view what they share, what they have in common, what they add different points, right? So, Koei, 35 minutes for you, and then we will take questions from the audience. Thank you very much. An applause for Koei, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Marcello, for the very generous introduction and thank you so much for the Adri for organizing such a wonderful uh, conference I've been learning a lot and I hope that I can also contribute to the uh, audience a little bit uh, by discussing the some of the newest findings uh, based on the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe the mega so today the, my lecture is titled Marx Engels the intellectual relationship revisited from an ecological perspective and uh, this is a Lukács Memorial Lecture, and it's very honored to have this type of lecture because I really like Lukács, and but I'm also critical of Western Marxism, so I'm going to criticize Western Marxism in my paper. But at the same time, Lukács is different in that he paid a particular attention to the concept of metabolism, Stoffwechsel, and so I'm I'll be talking about these issues in terms of the relationship between Marx and Engels. Okay, I begin. With the deepening of the ecological crisis and the neoliberal globalization, Marx's ecology recently attains more attention. And so like these are like developed by Foster and Barkett. And eco-socialists employ the concept of metabolic rift originated from capital and actively analyze the destructive side of capitalist production, such as global warming, disruption of nitrogen cycle, and extinction of species. Consequently, ecology has become one of the central fields for the Marxism today. However, not every Marxist agrees with this idea, and people like Zizek says that ecology is new opium for the masses. <laughs> Why? I think the problem goes back to the old problem of the intellectual relationship between Marx and Engels. The Western Marxism regarded natural science as Engels' domain of expertise in order to save Marx from mechanism and the positivism of the Soviet dialectical materialism. However, since Western Marxism ignored Marx's research on natural sciences, it now faces a dilemma that they cannot develop a Marxist critique of ecology unless it admits its earlier one-sided interpretation, because Marx also studied natural sciences quite a lot. Uh, due to this dilemma, some Marxists, like Zizek, hysterically reject the idea of eco-socialism. Ironically, in the history, it was Engels himself who emphasized this division of labor. According to him, especially in his preface to the second edition of Anti-Dueling, published after Marx's death, he says, Marx was well versed in mathematics, but we could keep up with natural science only piecemeal, intermittently, and sporadically. However, Engels later reflected on this blind spot, went through a complete as possible a molting, as Liebig calls it, in mathematics and the natural science. And in fact, we, know, we all know that in Anti-Dueling and Dialectic of Nature document that Engels seriously studied uh, natural sciences, biology, physics, and so on. However, Engels hides here some very important information from his readers. At the time, as an editor of Capital, Engels was sorting out Marx's manuscripts and notebooks. So he knew that Marx was also eagerly studying natural sciences before his death. However, Engels does not mention this fact. Marx, in his letter to Engels, dated July 4, 1864, conveyed that he was inspired by Engels to read some books on natural science. And he says, I quote, I invariably follow in your footsteps. However, Reading the seventh edition of the Liebig's Agricultural Chemistry in 1865, Marx much more intensively studied those natural sciences. So his reading list after 1868 covers various fields such as chemistry, geology, mineralogy, physiology, and botanica, etc., etc. And in December 19, 1882, 
Engels even acknowledged that Marx was more familiar what can be considered as a problem of increasing entropy due to the consumption of fossil fuel. I quote Engels again. The working individual is not only the stabilizer of the present, but also, and to a far greater extent, and the squander of the past, the solar heat. As to what we have done in the way of squandering our reserves of our energy, coal, forest, etc., you are better informed than I am. Nevertheless, in the preface to the anti dueling he does not mention this point. And this is very strange. Because Engels emphasized that the ideas developed in the anti dueling is fully compatible with Marx's vision, saying that, I quote, he read the whole manuscript to Marx before it was printed. And Marx fully agreed with Engels. That's what Engels says. However, such a proof was only highlighted after Marx's death. On the other hand, Engels did not refer to Marx's serious engagement with natural sciences, although the existence of Marx's notebooks on natural sciences would be the strongest proof for the dialectics of nature as their collaborative project. So one is tempted to interpret this unnatural science in a Freudian manner. Namely, Engels tacitly admitted that Marx's, en Marx's interest in natural sciences is somewhat different from Engels. So I'm going to talk about more about uh, Marx and uh, his theory of metabolism. Since it is well known today that both Marx and Engels passionately studied the natural sciences, the one-sidedness of Western Marxism is clear. However, one cannot immediately argue from this point that they both share the same interest in ecology as Foster and Bucket argue. It is necessary to carefully analyze this point. Of course, I'm not criticizing everyone from the Western Marxism, and I think the exception is Lukács, because Lukács, on the one hand, said that dialectics cannot be applied to nature, it can only be applied to uh, society. But later he corrected this view, and he says that metabolism is a concept that allows us to comprehend the unity and the intermediate uh, relationship between society and nature. So, and this concept of metabolism is the very key concept for the, today's analysis of metabolic rift by John Bellamy Foster and other people. And the most important meaning of Marx's concept of metabolism in Capital is his characterization of labor as a conscious and mediating activity of metabolism between humans and nature. I quote Marx, labor is a process between man and nature, a process by which a man through his own action mediates, regulates, and controls the metabolism between himself and nature, end of quote. In any society, human must work upon nature and satisfy their needs in order to live on this planet. But the concrete ways of metabolism between humans and nature is very different depending on how this mediating activity of labor is socially organized. In the Grundrisse, Marx pointed to the particular relationship between humans and nature in capitalism that is characterized by the separation of humans from nature. Marx's capital precisely analyzes this human alienation from nature under capitalist production. As elucidated in Capital Volume 1, the transhistorical labor process receives a new form as a valorization process under capitalism, and the material process of metabolism between humans and nature is accordingly transformed. Marx's capital repeatedly points to the robbery character of this transformation of the material world uh, from the perspective of the production of surplus value, and he also points to the danger of destructive consequences. Marx problematized the capitalist squandering in relation to the two fundamental factors of production, namely the exhaustion of labor power as well as natural forces. And famously, I kind of assume that you guys all know John Bellamy Foster. But <laughs> and famously, it was Liebig's agriculture chemistry that prompted Marx to integrate an analysis of robbery system of agriculture into capital. Liebig criticized the modern capitalist agriculture as robbery, which only aims at the maximization of short-time profit. And Liebig even warned against the collapse of European civilization due to this robbery agriculture. Marx praised Liebig's immortal merits for revealing the negative, destructive side of modern agriculture, and he argues, I quote, 
Capitalist production prevents the return to the soil of its constituent elements consumed by man in the form of food and clothing, hence it hinders the operation of the eternal condition for the lasting fertility of the soil. Thus it destroys at the same time the physical health of the urban worker and the intellectual life of the rural worker. During the 19th century, the exhaustion of the soil became the huge social issue in England. And Marx formulated the problem of soil exhaustion as a contradiction that capitalist production created in the metabolism between humans and nature. Marx clearly recognized the necessity to discuss more in detail how, in terms of how capitalism transforms and undermines the relationship between humans and nature. In other words, one reason for his intensive research on natural science in his late years is to investigate into the causes and influences of a metabolic rift. Now I come back to Marx and Engels again. So when Engels neglected Marx's notebooks on natural sciences in anti during there existed a difference between Marx and Engels concerning the concept of metabolism. The problem is discernible in Engels' edition of Capital. Certainly, Engels uh, recognized the importance of Libby, his critique of the rural agriculture, and uh, in the housing question and other works, he also emphasized the rural character of modern agriculture. However, things look a little different with regard to the concept of metabolism. So, robbery it's a kind of similar, but the concept of metabolism is a little bit different. Although Engels was aware that Marx also discussed the problem of soil exhaustion with Libby, his concept of metabolism, Engels intentionally changed particular sentence in Capital Volume 3. So in the, his original manuscript, I quote from German, because this English translation in the historical materialism doesn't uh, mistranslate this passage. Uh, in this way, Large-scale land ownership produce the conditions that provoke an irreparable rift in the interdependent process between social metabolism and natural metabolism prescribed by the natural laws of soil. The result of this is a squandering of the vitality of the soil, and the trade carries this devastation far beyond the bounds of single country, Libby. End of quote. Referring to Libby, Marx highlighted the danger of serious global disruption in the interdependent process between the social metabolism, so the production, circulation, and then consumption, and natural metabolism. So he clearly formulated a tense relationship between the capitalist economic form determination and the natural properties in the material world. So the social and the natural become sort of diverged. Engels modified the first sentence as follows. So this is what we usually read. In this way, it produces conditions that provoke an irreparable rift in the interdependent process of social metabolism, a metabolism prescribed by the law, the law of life itself. Now the word natural metabolism is omitted so that the contrast between the social metabolism and the natural metabolism became obscure. Certainly, there are many cases where Engels modified uh, Marx's expression whenever they are kind of confusing or unclear or even wrong. But this passage, uh, Marx's intention is very clear, but also this is a key passage for the, his theory of metabolism. So why did, Ma did Engels change this passage? I think it is helpful to consider Engels' dialectics of nature here. According to Engels, anti during intended to grasp the law of nature and history in a materialist manner. In other words, his project seeks to grasp the law as they objectively exist in nature. So instead of epistemologically exp explaining natural phenomena with a dialectical method, it is an ontological investigation in that it dialectically develops movements and evolution in nature as it is. And notably, Engels' dialectics of nature is tied to a practical demand for the realization of freedom through the domination and control of external nature. In fact, the construction of socialism as a free society means for Engels to become the real conscious lord of nature. I quote Engels. The external objective forces that have hitherto governed history pass under the control of man himself. Only from that time will man himself, with full consciousness, make his own history. Only from that time will the social causes set in movement by him have in the main and con constantly growing measure the results intended by him. 
It is a humanity's leap from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. According to Engels, not only by abolishing the domination of capital, but also by fully appropriating the law of nature, human can leap to the realm of freedom. Of course, but that doesn't mean that Engels thought that with the recognition of laws of nature, humans can arbitrarily manipulate nature. Rather, in Dialectics of Nature, he warned against revenge, the famous passage, Revenge by Nature. He says, let us not, however, flatter ourselves overmuch on account of our human victory over nature. For each such victory, nature takes its revenge on us, end of quote. So Engels also recognized the limits of nature and critically observed arbitrary human behavior towards nature, especially under capitalism. If the law of nature is ignored, the domination over nature fails, and the humans are obliged to behave passively at the mercy of nature's power. Engels' ecology is basically based on this discussion on the nature's revenge and criticized the short-sighted profit maximization in capitalism. The passage on metabolism or the metabolic rift in Capital Volume 3 is also modified by Engels in accordance to this scheme of nature's revenge. Engels' edition of Capital emphasizes that the violation of natural road of life would lead to a fatal consequences for human civilization. But in contrast, methodological approach unique to Marx's metabolic theory investigates how, this is how the law of nature or the, how the law of value dominant in the social metabolism modifies natural metabolism and causes an irreparable rift. And, but this point becomes rather obscure or unclear. Engels judged that the Marx original expression about entanglement of the economic form determination and the material world was hard to understand for readers and changed the sentence into a more accessible scheme of the revenge by nature. So what underlines in this editorial change by Engels is the fact that he did not really like leave his theory of metabolism. In, indeed, Engels in Dialectics of Nature refers to Liebig his concept of met metabolism in the context of criticizing Liebig as a dilettante in the biology. Concerning the origin of life, Liebig denied the possibility of a historical evolution and emergence of organic life and accepted the hypothesis of eternal life. So life is imported from the universe to this planet. In contrast, Engels argues that the life is a process of metabolism that historically emerged and evolved from non-life, and protein confirmed this point. So Engels sees the origin of life in the chemical process of assimilation and excretion, and he pointed to the possibility of artificially creating the living organism in the laboratory. Notably, while Engels' concept of metabolism emphasized the historical emergence of life, he rejected Liebig's vitalist understanding of metabolism, so he, Engels did not apply the concept of metabolism to the environmental issues. He simply rejected this concept at all. Consequently, lost is the law of theory of metabolism to analyze the relationality between humans and nature from both transhistorical and historical perspective, and to reveal the particularity and the contradictions of this relationship under capitalism. Rather, Engels limited the theoretical scope of metabolism to the process of origin and evolution of life that proceeded independently of human beings. So the main role of metabolism for Engels is accordingly not an eco ecological one, but a demonstration that the law of nature penetrates uh, the entire history. Since the metabolism between humans and nature as a link of political economy and ecology is missing, Engels' view remained a static idea of nature's revenge. And today, many people such as Jason Moore and uh, Neil Smith criticize that the Marx ecology is too static, uh, but they are basically criticizing uh, Engels' idea of revenge of nature. And uh, I argue that in contrast, Marx did not treat the disruption of the universal metabolism of nature under capitalism as this revenge by nature. Because capital analyzes the problem from two more perspectives. Firstly, capital does not accept such limits imposed by nature. That's what he emphasizes. 
In the Grundrisse, Marx pointed out that the elasticity of capital is a potent of capital. So whenever capital is confronted with the difficulty of capital accumulation, capital progressively establishes a system of general utility through further development of technologies and also invention of new use values and so on. However, since capital cannot take into account the material aspects of the world, it, its attempt to overcome natural limits does not solve its own contradiction, but only deepens it on the larger scale. An investigant, investigation into this dynamic relationship between capital and nature is the main topic for late Marx. While Engels formulated this trans-historical law of nature as science of universe, Marx's research shifted to more and more empirical topics in geology, agriculture, chemistry, and mineralogy, and so on. Namely, he aimed at comprehending capital's astonishing elasticity in the interdependent historical process in which human modifies nature and vice versa. And secondly, Marx's description about the uh, disruption of the metabolism avoids an apocalyptic tone of nature's revenge and highlights the active factor of resistance. The disruption of universal metabolism of nature obliges to establish a more conscious and social management of productive activities, as Marx emphasized in Capital, I quote, but by destroying the circumstances surrounding that metabolism, which originated in a merely natural and spontaneous fashion, the capitalist mode of production compels its systematic restoration as a regulative law of social production and in a form adequate to the full development of the human race." End of quote. Since capitalist production cannot fully take into account uh, the complex dimensions of social and natural metabolism, it destroys nature, annihilates the possibilities of coevolution of humans and nature, and even threatens the human civilization and the entire ecosphere. All what capital cares about is whether accumulation can be somehow achieved, can be somehow achieved, so it does not really matter even if the most part of the planet becomes unsuitable space to live for the humans and the other animals. Thus, instead of waiting for the collapse of capitalism thanks to the nature's revenge, it is indispensable, according to Marx, that individuals confronting the global ecological crisis take a measure for the conscious and active control over the metabolism with their environment. Five more minutes? Okay, so I'm running out of time, but I go on. <laughs> In Capital Volume 3, Marx famously wrote, this is a basically the discussion how real necessity persists and then the lilum necessity comes only after the lilum freedom is only after the lilum of hmm? lilum freedom is based on the lilum necessity the, uh, just recognizing the law of nature still remains in the lilum of necessity so for marx freedom is not limited to the conscious regulation of the law of nature but it includes creative activities of art enrichment of love friendship and hobbies such as sports and reading books in contrast, Engels, who are primarily concerned with dialectics of nature, put importance on human freedom based on the recognition of the trans-historical law of nature, and it is control over nature that immediately realizes the realm of freedom. This view impoverishes the contents of the realm of freedom, so that Engels did not highlight what Marx formulated as the full development of individuality in communism. So I finally come to the notebooks. Uh, Marx's theory of metabolism also helps understand why he so eagerly studied natural sciences after 1868. In this context, Karl Fraß, a German agronomist, is great importance. Marx wrote in his letter to Engels in March 25, 1868, that he found an unconscious socialist tendency in Fraß's work. Prompted by Marx's high evaluation, Engels also read Fraud's climate and plant over time, which deals with climate change in Asian civilizations due to the massive deforestation. There are excerpts from Lee Engels, uh, notebook of 1879 and 80s. And Engels' paraphrasing here precisely documents that his view on Fraud was clearly influenced by Marx. In this sense, the intellectual relationship between Marx and Engels in the natural science had been reversed 
compared to the 1864. So in 1864, he said, Marx said, I'm following Engels, but here Engels is actually following Marx. So there are two points where uh, Engels and Marx concentrate. The one is climate change due to the excessive deforestation. The other point is uh, Darwinianism. So firstly, in the above letter, Marx highlight, highly valued for us insight that cultivation when proceeds in a natural growth and it's not consciously controlled, leaves desert behind it. And Engels also wrote down the similar passages. And Engels also summarized the significance of Frass's work as a main proof that the civilization in its conventional forms is an antagonistic process which exhausts the soil, devastates the forest, renders the soil infertile for the original products, and worsens the climate and so on. The second point is basically the Darwinist argument how there is a natural selection and they are com the plants are competing with each other. But, so Engels must have thought that they, this is a common interest with Marx, but Marx has other, other interests at the same time. Because in the beginning of 1868, Marx, in addition to Frass, he was also reading Georg Ludwig von Mauler's book in which the, this German historian of law deals with the Germanic system of landed property, and in the same letter to Engels, dated 25th, uh, 1868, Marx found the same socialist tendency in Maurer's work. So why was Marx reading Frass and Maurer at the same time, and he found the same unconscious socialist tendency in both works? A hint can be found in Frass's quote from Maurer's book, because here, Flas highly evaluated the sustainability of the Germanic communes. He says, uh, I don't quote because I don't, I'm running out of time, but basically, Flas says that the Germanic communes are very sustainable because they, everything produced in the communes and then they consumed within the communes. So Flas did not maintain that all the pre-capitalist societies ignore the law of nature and the left desert behind them. Rather, in the Germanic society, the soil productivity increased under the sustainable production. And the Germanic communes imposed on the communal control over the land usage, so which enabled the sustainable production. In contrast to nature's revenge due to the ignorance of the law of nature in pre-capitalist societies, Marx recognized that the sustainable metabolism between humans and nature in communal production functioned as a source of vitality, as he emphasized this point in the letter to Vela Zasulic later. This vitality precisely comes from the power of sustainable agrarian communes. The metabolism there was mediated by totally different ways in comparison to capitalism, and its sustainability could provide a material foundation for the resistance against capitalism. As Flas and Maula focused on this dimension of vitality of the communes, Marx found a socialist tendency in their works, and he later studied uh, pre-capitalist societies in the 70s. And I'm coming to my last point. In relation to Flass and Darwin, uh, I'm discussing the notebooks of 1878 very shortly. Joseph Beat Jukes also discussed how climate and precipitation affect the geological formation as well as flora and fauna. In this section titled Paleontology, Jukes, directly referring to Darwin, pointed to a great climate change over time and argued that alternation of climate involved destruction of species. In this vein, Marx also noted Jukes' remark that extinction of species is still going on and man himself is the most active exterminator. Marx studied climate change from a long-term geological perspective and their impact upon the environment, paying particular attention to the human impacts as Frass did. A similar remark on climate change in North America can be found in his excerpt from John Eats' Natural History of the Raw Materials of Commerce, where he, Marx says, the enormous clearing of the forest have already sensibly modified the climate. So here, Marx's interest in Darwin and Flass is not limited to Engels' encyclopedic topics such as the origin of life, natural selection, and evolution, but more concrete ways of human metabolic interaction with nature. So I'm coming to conclusion. So while Engels was more interested in transhistorical law of nature, and he's concerned with the encyclopedic uh, 
understanding of uh, laws of nature in each field of physics, uh, biology, and uh, chemistry, and so on. Marx was more interested in concrete historical ways of interacting of humans with nature and how this is modified under the logic of capitalism and how that was differently organized in pre-capitalist societies and how that can be used as a place of resistance against the logic of capital and so on. However, unfortunately, due to the difference of theoretical concern, Marx's notebooks were totally neglected by Engels and other Marxists in the 20th century. So today, it is necessary to examine these forgotten notebooks published in the MEGA to rediscover an, an, an astonishing scope of Marx's critique of political economy. Thank you so much. Many thanks to Koei Saito for his insightful um, presentation. I would just like to call your attention on a couple of points. <clears throat> so, Koei told us about Marx's notebooks, Marx's readings, and um, also um, Engels' ecology. I think it's interesting for us to see that uh, Marx and Engels' relationship is revisited now around these new topics. So it is not only and merely the old discussion about the early philosophical writings or the journalism, etc., but Koei showed us how to work with the new materials how to use them, how to see the way that Engels edited volume three. And uh, this is a proof that the research on Marx is alive, that there is still so much to do. And most importantly, around the topics that are very relevant for us in our contemporary society. So I'm gonna take two, three questions. I already see Mezzadra and then Desai. And I just ask you to be as short as possible so we will have a possibility to more questions and Koei to answer. Please. Um, thanks. Mezzadri, actually, I know we're two with the share, the share cropping. <laughs> share cropping surnames from Italy. Um, thank you so much. That was a fantastic lecture. And I have two very quick questions. One is the destruction of nature uh, goes hand in hand with the oppression of indigenous people today. So I wonder in your view in practice, the rediscovery of this new take on uh, metabolisms, plural, how does illuminate and help us in addressing this issue? And the second, which is related, is um, there's a huge amount of feminist literature on ecology and uh, ecofeminism. I'm referring to the work of uh, Maria Mies, of course, in 86, uh, Patrick in accumulation on, the, um, on, on a world scale that actually inspired very much the work of Jason Moore, but also the work with Vandana Shiva on ecofeminism, and more recently the work of Stefania Barca. And I wonder if uh, you, you, know, you think this material actually instead is helpful in highlighting some of the issues that you talk about in relation to Marx then reading of pre-capitalist uh, uh, societies having a different type of uh, understanding of uh, the relations between the two different metabolisms, uh, social and natural. Thank you. Thank you. That's I. Microphone is coming. Anybody after? Uh, first thing, I think a biographical point. Uh, after the publication of volume one of Capital, Marx stops doing economics as far as I can see. He does not revise the drafts of volume two and volume three. He transfers himself to studying nature, Russian uh, land, uh, land institutions, and so on. And you, know, I, you may or may not, that's not concerned about your paper, but there is a question. Why did this man for 16 years he lived after 1867 never come back to capital volume two and three? Was he worried about the elasticity of capitalism, of capital, and its, its, uh, its possibility of surviving much longer, or was it he was disappointed by the reception of, of volume, volume one? And secondly, about the elasticity of capital that you, you emphasize as between uh, Engels and Marx, uh, I, I kind of feel that Marx is more historical and more dynamic than Engels is. Engels wants to find constant laws of nature. Well, Marx knows that things change and how they change are basically through human agency. Would, would you agree? Thank you. The colleague there. OK, 
Can right. you introduce yourself, please? <clears throat> My name is Barbara Harris White. I'm from Oxford. Thanks. Thank you for that highly original lecture. Much appreciated. Um, I have two kinds of questions. Um, one is whether in the uh, sources that you have consulted, Engels and Marx distinguish matter materials from energy and the metabolism of energy. And the second question is that I believe that part of Marx's critique of the relationship between capitalist production relations and nature was that capitalism couldn't restitute the um, product of capitalist consumption back to nature. And I wondered whether in your research um, you find any more hints about what Marx meant by the concept of restitution. Thank you. Next one here. It's difficult sometimes to understand. The acoustic is problematic. Can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. This is Avinash from CECC Adri. Well, uh, thank you so much for a comprehensive presentation. Marx was more concerned with taking a long-term view about the Earth at, at a geographical time scale, and uh, he could discover some of the issues of climate change and environmental resource management degradation way back UN could discover it. But I was curious to know if the concept and the idea of eco-socialism that was initiated by Marx and some of the greatest viewpoints of Angel as well have changed with time of the contemporary philosophers or not. Did you find something in your research of that short? Thank you. Can I close it here? So I would like to give five to six minutes to Kohei to respond perhaps very superficially to this sets of Okay, so, some of the questions are because of the acoustics I didn't uh, get, but me, maybe you can repeat. I'm sorry. But uh, for the first question, uh, this destruction of nature and the destruction of metabolism, in, in the context of today, of the globalization, I think it is very uh, interesting to go back to his rate writings uh, because Marx was dealing not just with natural sciences, but also these issues of pre-capitalist and non-Western societies. And this is actually what's happening right now. So the problem of ecological crisis is sort of outsourced to the global south. And uh, the problem of ecological crisis is much more serious in those areas not in the developed countries. And I think that was the direction that Marx was also going because Marx very seriously studied how in the age of the globalization in the 19th century, how the margins of the capitalism, as Kevin Anderson argues, how the most ac acute contradictions of capitalism rather appears in the margins the, where the capitalism confronts with non-capitalist societies. And this is what Marx was studying. The, uh, Marx recognized just the revolution in developed countries, capitalist country, is not enough. Be, uh, the contradiction appears at the margin. So uh, he thought that the unity between the workers in England and the workers or like the other people in Russia or Poland and Ireland are absolute conditions for the coming socialist revolution. And uh, this is the same problem that we are witnessing today. The uh, environmental problem cannot be simply uh, resolved in the Japan or in Germany, but it, 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 because we are creating the issues in China and India and in other societies. So I think that we are uh, witnessing the very similar problem. And Marx can be very useful to reformulate uh, these uh, practical issues. And for the gender, I also think that I didn't deal with this issue because I'm not expert in the feminism, so I don't talk much about it. But uh, I think that as Hida Brown or Kevin Anderson showed in the, their recent studies, there is also another intellectual, uh, this problem of the intellectual relationship between Marx and Engels. And they clearly show that uh, Marx's interest in the pre-capitalist societies is very different from the Engels. The Engels uh, discussed this issue in this uh, book on the state and uh, so on, the origin of families. But then the way Engels used uh, the Marx notebooks very 
sort of distorted the Marx's original interest and so on. I cannot really elaborate that point because I'm not expert, but then you can read these books and they are really great. Okay, so the, for the you know, Professor Desai's question, Marx came back to the issue, uh, Marx came back to volume two many times and he left seven more drafts after 1868. In total, there are eight manuscripts, and seven are made after 1868. And in relation to the natural sciences, we can talk about the rate of profit or the theory of rent. And the, also, Marx also discusses uh, ecological issues in relation to the turnover of capital. So Marx was reading natural sciences not just for fun or simply ecological concerns, but also he was trying to integrate these new findings into the manuscripts. So I think it's interesting to reread these manuscripts published in the second section of MEGA from that perspective. And uh, I, Barbara, I didn't quite get at your question that I'm running out of time, so maybe I can come to you after this talk. And uh, for the eco-socialism, this concept, uh, we don't find the term eco-socialism in Marx. No? This is something that we later invented. And uh, still some people really for a long time argued that the Marx eco-socialism uh, may be sometimes useful, but the Marx was not seriously interested in eco ecology, so there are many limitations. But I think by looking at these notebooks, we can learn how systematic actually it, the, for Marx was to study natural science in order to complete his critique of political economy. So the political economy really systematically includes the problem of ecology or ecological crisis as the main component of his system. And I think uh, without that point today, we cannot really discuss Marx capital anymore. Thank you. Once again, many thanks to Kuei Saito. And uh, let's move on to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Saito and Professor Musto for chairing this session seamlessly.